Welcome everyone to our MSRI online seminars. So uh, if you were here for the conferences, uh, the seminars work a little bit differently. You do have the power to unmute yourself. So that means two things. One, keep it muted when you're not asking a question, but when you wanna ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and, and jump in. Um, and uh, this week, we're very happy to have Von Jones um, of Vanderbilt. Uh, and currently in Bodega Bay, uh, telling us about uh, two one factors and cusp forms. All right, so I shall start. Um, so uh, this is a a, um, a program, if you like, that I actually started uh, almost forty years ago now, <laughs> and I just returned to it uh, recently. So I want to give you some. Uh, the, the idea of what I was trying to do, why I was trying to do it, and um, what the new approach uh, has. So, so here we go. I wouldn't mind. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay. The um, idea. Uh, so first of all, I need to tell you what a two-one factor is. Hopefully, everyone knows this, but um, let me just uh, say it again. A two-one factor is first of all, it's an algebra M <coughs> for Neumann algebra which acts typically on Hilbert spaces, and uh, they will be infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but uh, there is a way to measure their dimension um, according to the algebra which, acting, which is acting on them. And in fact, there is a unique dimension function, uh, which is the, which we're gonna use the notation dimension of H, uh, sub dimension sub M of H, and um, it's a real number, the, the sort of underlying Hilbert space is infinite dimensional as a Hilbert space, but as an M module, it has a real dimensional um, number, which is between zero and infinity. And uh, it's very nice in that it characterizes the um, dimension in the same sense that ordinary Hilbert space is characterized by its dimension um, as a vector space. So all numbers uh, in the interval from zero to infinity uh, can occur. So this stuff was done not exactly as such, but um, the the guts of it, the content was done by Marian von Neumann in the 1930s. And I will give precise definitions and examples after this introduction. But so all you just, all you have to uh, accept now is that there is this real value continuous dimension. Um, and there was an example which was, which got me going on it, which is the, uh, if you have a subfactor, so if you have a subfactor n uh, of a two one factor m, then you can think of the big one as being a, a Hilbert space over the small one, and um, the number that you consider, which we called the index, was um, the dimension of m as a an n module. So just think of the if you think of if you just had the field if n and m were fields, then this would just be the degree of the extension of the field. So in the early 1980s, it was shown that this uh, index, which a priori is a real number because the Murray von Neumann dimension is real, uh, is it actually exhibits both discrete and continuous behavior in that if it's um, in the, uh, if it's less than four, then it's one of these numbers four cosine squared pi over n for n equals three, four, five, and so on. If it's bigger than four, it doesn't have any particular reason to be uh, anything discrete. Or integer, and it's actually a, a uh, arbitrary real number. And of course, all of these numbers, four cosine squared pi over n, they all actually occur. Um, so that's one thing. And now I'd like to tell you about uh, Hecker groups, a little bit about Hecker groups. So here's a simple question about uh, two by two matrices. Question is, we give ourselves the uh, the two matrices one lambda zero one and zero one minus one zero. Those are two perfectly innocent um, two by two matrices. They have determinant one. Um, lambda is going to be chosen to be positive real. We can work in, in the reals. So the question is: For what values of lambda do those two matrices generate a discrete subgroup of SL two R? Okay, it's a fine question. 
And the answer was found by Fricker and Klein. Um, I don't know the exact history, but I believe they're the ones who find, found it in Heckerhead, something to do with the further study. We don't have Terry Gannon on, unfortunately, so I can't get the exact story. But um, so the answer is that the, these two matrices generate a discrete subgroup, if and only if either lambda is in this set uh, two cosine pi over n for n equals three, four, or five, and so on, or uh, the closed interval, well, the interval from two to infinity. Actual infinity doesn't make sense here, but. All right, so you'll notice that this set of these values for the Hecker groups is the, exactly the square roots of the indices of subfactors. And the identity of this set and the set of index values for subfactors has been an obsession of mine for almost 40 years. If you know me over these years, you will for sure have heard me uh, rave on about this and, uh, and try to understand it and understand whether this is actually a coincidence, just the way it goes, or is there a direct connection between the, the two results? Now, for instance, um, for Neumann algebras are uh, part of representation theory. If you're looking at the unitary representation theory of anything you're dealing with for Neumann algebras. Uh, so there should be a representation theoretic construction of the subfactors, right? I mean, that's, uh, the, the, if we go back to that result about subfactors, um, if you want to actually construct these guys, I said they all exist. The original construction was somewhat ad hoc and a bit lucky, one might even say. Um, so the, what one would like, uh, what one, one did like, want, was a uh, representation theory construction of these special discrete series, uh, you might say, of uh, subfactors. Well, you know, when you put that alongside the, uh, the um, Hecker group and its parameters, you think, well, you know, this is it, right? It's got to be here. The Hecker group scream out is an obvious place to look for this construction of these subfactors. Well, it may look obvious that that's where you should look, but um, guess what? I've been trying forever and have never actually done it. Um, the case, uh, I think, um, I said later on perhaps, but I should go come back to the, that sequence, but I just say right now that a representation and theoretic construction of the subfactors was achieved by uh, Anthony Wasserman in the 1990s, but the groups involved in that group, in that construction are loop groups rather than discrete or locally compact groups. So the message there is there is a representation theoretic construction of the subfactors, but it doesn't come from Hecker groups, at least so far. Right, so now let me get back to the Hecker groups, tell you a little bit more about them. Um, the case n equals three, uh, so that's two cosine pi over three, which you will know is actually equal to one, lambda equals one, that's the usual group SL2Z. I probably won't distinguish much between SL2Z and PSL2Z in this talk. Um, but so here is a picture of a fundamental domain for the action on the upper half plane. So we're all very familiar with this for uh, n equals three for SL2Z, this, that's the fundamental domain. But uh, for the Hecker groups, you just have to replace the n over three, the, the, the three, this point here for SL2Z is e to the i pi over three. If you just replace uh, three by n, you get the fundamental domain for the Hecker groups. And you'll notice that as n tends to infinity, this root of unity is going towards one. And in the limiting case, uh, n equals infinity, you get the uh, fundamental domain for a, um, for a finite index subgroup of uh, SL2Z. I guess when n is equal to six, you also get uh, something to do with, uh, when actually when n is four and six, you also get um, arithmetic groups, which are somewhat like, um, SL2Z, but for the values like five and so on, which of course are irrational index subfactors, um, you get some different and interesting uh, Hecker group. All right, in general, 
a discrete subgroup of SL2 is called the Fuchsian group. Uh, some people insist that Fuchsian groups have finite covolume. Uh, and now the Hecker groups have finite covolume exactly when lambda is, equal, is less than or equal to two. So let me explain that. Um, when lambda is equal to two, this, the fundamental domain, uh, this, the, this starts here at one and goes to this vertical line there. And here we have minus one and the fundamental domain is between that and that. So if lambda is bigger than two, all of a sudden this edge of the fundamental domain has gone out and you have a huge uh, infinite covolume coming from this interval here. So I guess, I'm, I mean, I don't think I need to tell you, but if lambda is bigger than two, the fundamental domain starts, it has this vertical line starting bigger than one, meeting the, the real axis bigger than one. So this gives you infinite covolumes. So Vaughn, we have a question from Ian Agle. Um, Good, okay, Ian. Now, is there you? I can't hear the question, Ian. Someone needs to un unmute the, Ian. Uh, it was in, it was in chat. Um, oh, okay. Is there a unique uh, subfactor for each index greater than four? Uh, you mean less than four, right? The discrete oh, series. Sorry. Um, or well, both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the answer is uh, so yes and no. The, the strictly speaking, it's no, but um, with certain caveats, uh, there is a finite number for each uh, of these indices. What first caveat is you have to be in the so-called hyperfinite two one factor. Then it's a result of Popper that and and Okneanu that there is a unique, uh, well, almost unique. This the classification is actually by um, Dinkin diagrams is an ADE classification. Um, and interestingly enough, E7 does not occur, but um, E6 and E8 occur. They have indices four cosine squared pi over 12 and four cosine squared pi over 30, respectively. And um, so there's a, for those particular values, there's more than one. There's also the D series, which gives you more than one, but essentially that it's unique. Um, for index bigger than four, that's a wide world. Um, there's this uh, property called finite depth. And it's known that for finite depth, there is, this is Popper's theorem, there is a uh, um, sort of uniqueness theorem that says that there's only so many, but um, it's the classification of finite depth becomes a combinatorial problem, but it's very unsolved as a, um, there's a survey paper which is now somewhat out of date by Noah and Scott and myself, which gives you um, classification between four and uh, five, and then that's been pushed up to five plus something or other. Noah, perhaps you can tell me the exact value. The yeah, the, this is this uh, Afzali, uh, Morris and Penny's got yeah. up to five and a quarter. But again, that that's for just the, the finite depth ones. I mean, as you said, once you get above four, the the infinite depth ones, depth ones, there's not gonna be anything at all, right? So, I mean, like with, you expect, I mean, you can't restrict to just this finite index, oh, sorry, the, the hyperfinite case anymore. So for, index above four. Yeah, that's probably more answer than you want at the end. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a whole different um, world. And uh, I sort of don't particularly want to go into much more detail on that because I'll never finish uh, what I want to say. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I, I was just, if you were, had a construction from a Hecke group, then presumably it wouldn't be one to one. I mean, um, you'd get multiple. Well, uh, one, one actually, one would expect a construction for that for the Hecker, from the Hecker group to not give you hyperfinite things. Uh, so there wouldn't be you, at this stage in our technology, we wouldn't have any classification at all. So there's some, um, yeah. Uh, maybe we can go on with that because when I describe my my. Uh, motivation a bit further. 
So let me go on. The Hecker groups have uh, finite covariance. So, all right. So here we go. The attempt to construct subfactors of the correct indices using Hecker groups has so far been a failure. Right. So, but on the other hand, I'm not, I still, I'm, I refuse to give up. The idea is that um, the, the reason that I've first motivation for taking up this um, project again was that, you know, there's lots of, besides Hecker groups, there's all kinds of Fuchsian groups and so on, and it's triangle groups and um, subgroups of it, uh, finite index of everything. And in the search to try to get more of these subfactors and therefore fusion categories coming from, you know, every time you have a subfactor that gives you uh, fusion categories and, and um, what are the words? Uh, um, well, anyway, I'm <laughs> sorry, the words are escaping me. I hadn't thought of talking about that. But anyway, lots of uh, fusion categories from the subfactor. Um, and here we go. So I, here I said, in the last year or so, I've returned to this question motivated by the desire to construct more subfactors and their attendant bimodule categories from more general Fuchsian groups. But so far, uh, you know, it's all been a bit of a failure in that. And here, here we go. Here's one of the reasons. What makes the problem rather difficult from the start is the fact that the most significant Fuchsian Hecker group is none other than PSL2Z, right? That's the one, you know, everyone's supposed to know about, which corresponds to a subfactor of index one. So absolutely nothing on the subfactor side. So you've got this rich PSL2Z, and if there was this construction, then that would, um, you know, the sub, you know, there's no way to go back from the subfactor of index one to PSL2Z, at least so far. So, so here we go. The subfactor construction remains as elusive as ever, but there has been spin-off. And uh, if things really work out as, as, as they might, uh, it's very wishful thinking, but the spin-off could actually be far more significant than the original problem. And uh, that's, that's what this talk is about. So now, um, I guess the time is not too bad. I'm just about ready to start the talk uh, after the motivation. I'll make the usual excuses for errors that I would in a Blackboard talk, uh, which this is supposed to be. So in other words, don't assume that any formula is literally correct unless I insist that it is. And there's one or two which I will insist. It's rather important that they are what they are. So let me, uh, let me pause for a second for questions. i open the floor for questions. Anyone have anything they want to ask about the motivation? Okay, Noah, you're looking at the chats, I presume. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got the chat open. There haven't been any questions. Question. Okay. So um, I want to describe this, this dream that would actually be more significant than the original problem. Um, and, and this is what I'm going to call the Holy Grail. So, uh, but before that, I need a, some, some background in a couple of areas. One of those areas will be uh, two one factors, but more. But let me start with the other area, which is cusp forms, which is possibly less familiar to, uh, to this particular audience. So my definitions are more or less standard. Um, so uh, I think I'm not, I won't upset anyone by uh, giving these actual, you know, precise uh, verbiage. So we have, we have the first definition is a modular function for PSL2Z of even weight P is a holomorphic function uh, from the upper, uh, upper half plane. This script H is supposed to be the upper half plane to the, compl to the complex numbers. And it satisfies this um, modular condition that if you take a, a matrix in SL2Z, then F of AZ plus B over CZ plus D is CZ plus D to the P, where P is an even integer times F of Z. So the fact that P is even um, means that this actually passes to PSL2Z because if you take the minus, minus the identity in, in there, it's, this is actually one. So in particular, uh, if we take the matrix um, zero, one, uh, sorry, one, one, zero, one, shift the translation on the upper half plane by one, then CZ plus D is actually one. So we get F of Z plus one equals F of Z. So we may consider F 
there's a function of q, it's periodic, so you can write it as a function of q, which is e to the 2 pi i z. Now, uh, this means that we can, be, being, it being holomorphic, we can write it as a uh, power series, a Laurent series in Q. Um, and depending on how that Laurent series works, uh, we call it various names. So if the Laurent series is actually a Taylor series, if F is the sum from n equals zero of the, that starts from zero, so there's no negative powers of Q, it's called a modular form and a modular, uh, as opposed to a modular function, and a modular form is called a cusp form if A0 is equal to zero. In other words, it starts with um, a non-zero power of Q. If you like that, uh, another way of saying that is that as uh, Q goes to zero, which means that Z is going to I infinity, right? Um, maybe we'll go, this is important to start with, so let me go back to this picture. Uh, Q going to zero means that Z in this, in this picture here is going up to I infinity, up, up the top of the, the thing. So that's what Q tends to zero means. Well, if this uh, Taylor series starts with Q, some, some constant times Q, then the um, function is actually vanishing exponentially fast as you go up the uh, imaginary axis. Okay, so the simplest cusp form that you ever run into is the uh, modular discriminant, which comes, of course, from elliptic curves. Um, and it is, uh, this is what it is. It's Q, so it starts with Q, so it's a cusp form. And it's the product from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus Q to the n to the 24. And uh, you can show, unlikely though it looks, this, this is actually a cusp form. The SL2Z is generated by 1, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So all you have to do is show that this thing, uh, this function here is invariant, that's almost invariant when you uh, send Z to uh, minus 1 over Z, which looks a bit bizarre in Q space. And um, it's, you know, you have to do something some um, Poisson summation or something to show that this has this, this property, but that's uh, very old and classical. This is a cusp form of weight uh, 12. Uh, the modular invariance property can and should be thought of this. So now I'm going to change the point of view. That's the sort of classical story that you see. And here's another couple of rewordings of it, which are going to lead immediately to our point of view on the whole thing. The modular, first of all, the modular invariance property can and should be thought of as a fixed point property. So if we let um, SL2R, all of SL2R uh, acts on functions, um, well, all functions from H, the upper half plane, uh, by um, this, you have to put the inverse here because of, you know, group left and right chunk. So G inverse of a function on Z is this factor times uh, G applied to Z. G is A, B, C, D. So it doesn't now we're in SL2R. So this um, way of writing it says that uh, this modular condition is exactly the same as saying that, uh, that F um, is fixed by PSL2Z for this action. So all of SL2 is, R is acting and the modular condition translates to saying that uh, F is fixed by PSL2Z. Any questions on that? Okay, we can go one step further in rewriting it in a different way, which is going to be what we're really going to want. And we can say that let's let um, curly F sub S, this magic number S is going to come in. Now it's going to play a big role. So if FS denotes the vector space of all functions, acted on by SL2R as above. So now I really mean all functions, but that may be uh, measurable, um, all functions that one might consider. Uh, all functions acted as above with P equals S, it's a vector space. And here's the deal. Multiplication by a modular function determines a linear map from, oh, 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 oh I didn't think I have a typo. This, this F, this curly F here is actually this V here. 
So if you take a function and you multiply it by f, then you we, we, we can think of that as being a map from Vs to Vp plus s, which intertwines the action of SL2z. So we're going to take the, the space Vs on which all of SL2r is acting with this uh, special formula, which depends on s. And then we're going to take these two for Vs and Vp plus s. And we're just going to take the multiplication oper operator by f, go from Vs to Vp plus s. And the modular condition, another way of saying it is simply that this intertwines the action of SL2z. OK. Any questions on that? So we, this is an important point of view. We're going to think of these modular forms as being intertwined as linear maps, multiplication linear maps from two vector spaces. And the condition, the modular condition is simply that they intertwine the action of SL2Z. So Vs and Fs are the same thing, right? Yes, sorry, that was a typo. I, I apologize. I thought I got rid of them all, but I, apparently I didn't. Anyway, they're going to, the ones we're really interested in are going to be called something else soon. So. <laughs> so cusp forms are of great interest in number theory and our program certainly aims to exploit this, but for the moment, our goals and achievements are more modest. So if my dream actually works, then we will have genuine uh, results in number theory, but not really there yet. I mean, well, we'll see in, to what extent we're there. So, sorry, I'm confused about what, um, vector space of all functions acted on by SL, but it looks like you're acting on, all, what are these fun, is this a, is this a specific class of functions that you're yeah, acting like, on? Yeah, well, like, you know, you name it. Um, how about? Oh, so you choose. Anything that you, at this stage, anything that you can construct without using the axiom of choice. So, you know, continuous, um, measurable, and so on. I'll, I'll be precise about that. Okay, so, great. Okay. All right, so that's the algebra. The, from the algebra, this cusp form, this modular condition, just as an intertwining condition. But what about the analysis? Okay, we've got to have both of these. And so it's a simple matter using invariance. Um, it takes a, a couple of minutes to show that if, if you have a cusp form, I'm talking SL2Z here, um, then you can show that the, the cusp form F of Z actually has a certain growth condition. If it's a weight P, then in the entire upper half plane, it's, it's less than or equal to some constant times the imaginary part of Z to the minus P over two, okay? And some people, um, if you change from a cusp from SL2Z to some other general Fuchsian group, they use this as a definition of a, of, a, uh, of a cusp form. But what it means for us is that there's multiplication operators between function spaces. So now I'm thinking LP, for instance, and I'm really thinking L2, um, will actually be bounded operators um, exactly when they intertwine the actions of SL2Z. So this is a, one of these lovely coincidences that the algebra and the analysis uh, combine. This thing gives you that it's a bounded operator for this when it goes between these two function spaces. And the algebra says that it intertwines SL2Z when it goes through the, between these two function spaces. So I hope that sort of answers the question I was just asked. Um, as a Hilbert space addict, which I certainly am, the function spaces to look at are L2 and holomorphic L2 Hilbert spaces with certain measures. Okay. So now I'm going to define the uh, function spaces that I really want, that are going to be the things for which all of our technique is going to work. Um, this curly H sub S is going to be the closed subspace of L2 of form the holomorphic functions, you know that uh, by some version of Cauchy's formula, um, holomorphic functions actually form a closed subspace of the L2 functions, which is a wonderful fact. And here's the measure. So S is now going to be a real number, bigger than one. And this is the measure L2 of H y to the s times dx dy over y squared in the upper half plane. Okay, this space is defined for all uh, real s bigger than one. Um, 
and then it's holomorphic. If, if S is equal to one, then you get a bit of a problem here. You don't get too many functions. But if S is actually strictly bigger than one, and this is called, this space is known as Bergman space. I'll say a bit more about what people usually do who work in Bergman space, but uh, for us, that's what this is going to be Bergman space. All right. And the operators uh, MF for F a cusp form, weight P, are bounded operators just by multiplication from HS to H of S plus P. As such, they have um, adjoints, so they're bounded operators in Hilbert space, MF star, so which goes in the opposite direction. And MF star MF commutes with the action of SL2Z or in general, the you know, general Fuchsian group, it, it also works. I'm sweeping something under the rug here for real values of S. Uh, as I've really said it, this is only really works for um, S being an even integer, but that's actually not a problem. Um, now, because we're going to holomorphic functions, MF star is not just a multiplication operator. Typically, the adjoint and Hilbert space is multiplied by the uh, complex conjugate, but that then you've got to reproject onto um, the holomorphic ones. So the combination MF star MF is what's called a triplets operator because it involves that reprojection. Uh, any questions on that? So we have this continuous family now of Hilbert spaces of holomorphic functions, and we're thinking of our cusp forms as multiplication operators which go from the HS to the HS plus P because they're bounded, they have adjoints. All right, so that's the end of the, uh, what I need to just go over for cusp forms. And maybe I'll just wait if there's anyone who's got a question on that. Okay. And I suppose everyone is now familiar with cusp forms. We have an example, which is the, um, the, um, the modular discriminant which comes, of course, from elliptic, um, elliptic functions. It will be amusing, I guess, that by the end of this lecture with our techniques, we will have, um, I'll be able to describe all cusp forms for um, SL2Z. Of course, it's very well known, but this will be a slightly different way of doing it. Right now, I need to give you the background on uh, von Neumann algebras, um, in particular, uh, type 2, 1 factors. Now, it's nice that um, we don't have to go beyond type 2, 1 factors, so it's, we have a very short course. The most immediate example of a 2, 1 factor arises when we take the left regular representation of a group gamma on little l2 of gamma. Gamma acts unitarily by permuting the obvious orthonormal basis indexed by group elements, characteristic functions of group elements. If gamma were finite, the center of the algebra generated by the left regular representation would be spanned by functions constant on conjugacy classes. But infinite groups, uh, something new arises, and that is that they can have no non-trivial finite conjugacy classes. And this center disappears. So the little um, acronym here is ICC, that stands for infinite conjugacy classes. So a group is called ICC if it has infinite conjugacy classes. Uh, free groups are ICC, obviously, PSL2Z is ICC. I could give a much longer list, but that's, these are the only ones that we're really going to be concerned with here. In fact, you know, if you just take your take any old group, then up to some small, either it's sort of essentially abelian or up to some small nonsense, it's actually ICC. So, you know, lots of groups are ICC. The closure of the group algebra on L2 gamma is called uh, for Neumann of gamma. Okay, so this is the notation I've been trying to push for years and years and years amongst my colleagues that don't take it. But, you know, if talking to another audience, if I just used L of gamma, then that would go in one ear and out the other. Whereas for Neumann of gamma is pretty clear. This is the for Neumann algebra of the group, group for Neumann algebra. So once again, you take the group algebra acting on little L2, all the group elements are linear, linear independent. So you get the actual group algebra and, um, take its closure in the topology pointwise convergence, um, is that's called the group von Neumann algebra. Its center is trivial. I said the center disappears while it disappears from the closure as well. The 
the center is trivial of gamma is ICC. Uh, and to, to be a phenomenon algebra whose center is trivial, uh, that gets, you get to be called a factor. The type two uh, part of the factor comes from the existence of a trace on the phenomenon algebra. It's very simple. If lambda gamma is left regular representation, so left regular representation is the just permuting the basis, um, and the whole algebra is spanned densely by the linear combinations of these guys. Well, the trace is um, the trace of lambda gamma is either zero or one. And it's one if gamma is the identity and zero if it's the um, not the identity. So this is what happens in the regular representation of finite groups. The trace is is exactly given by this. Um, whoops. So this extends by linearity. That's easy by linear independence and by a not very difficult argument at all by continuity to all of the phenomena algebra. So this um, particular phenomena algebra, this group phenomena algebra is a factor because it's ICC and it has a trace which makes it a 2-1 factor. Right. So uh, for Neumann algebra of gamma should be considered as an algebra in its own right. I said that it acted on um, uh, little l2, but you can just abstractify it and take it as an algebra and then it can actually act on other Hilbert spaces, most obviously uh, direct sums of L2 of gamma. So if you have it acting on L2, it's going to act on this direct sum of a bunch of copies of L2 and um, the, the sort of other representations of it. Um, and in fact, uh, this this uh, screen says that it's actually, uh, you get all representations essentially um, by taking direct sums of L2 of gamma. So it's a pretty useful thing to be able to do. Uh, one other thing which is going to crop up, uh, and certainly um, philosophically this is very important, uh, that you can obtain the little L2 space from the phenomenon algebra itself and its trace. Um, if you define, uh, so I'm going to work on the phenomenon algebra, which is this algebra, and I define the inner product xy to be the trace of y star x. Okay, the trace is a linear function, blah, blah, blah. It is trivial, and really is trivial. But the completion of phenomenon algebra with respect to this inner product is actually the Hilbert space little l2 of gamma. And this is really important. We call it capital L2 of gamma. Uh, sorry, we call it capital L2 of M, where M is the phenomenon algebra. So these two things, little l2 of gamma and capital L2 of the algebra, are the same thing. They're just trivially the same. So here we go. If you get nothing else out of this part of the talk, you should get this. This L2 of M which is little l2 of gamma is really significant. And it's the left module of rank one philosophically for the phenomenon algebra. It's just, it plays the role of M itself. It's just, you have to complete it to get a Hilbert space for analysis reasons. And all other Hilbert space modules can be obtained as subspaces of direct sums of l2 of M. Okay. So this thing of dimension one is super important. You can get everything else from it just by taking invariant subset subspaces of direct sums. And as such, there is a unique dimension function, this is what I talked about in the introduction, for such Hilbert spaces, uh, with, which is uniquely characterized by these two properties. The dimension of L2 of M, I said it's the thing of rank one, so it gets to have dimension one. And then the dimension is additive over countable uh, direct sums. So, um, this, there is this dimension function and all non-negative um, numbers arise as the dimension and any two Hilbert spaces with the same direct dimension are unitarily equivalent in modules. All right, so that's quite a bit to swallow uh, if you've never seen it before. So I will um, ask you to ask questions, someone who, for whom this is a bit of a mystery. No questions, so that means either you're completely lost or you know it already. So <laughs> I guess the format of this anyway, don't don't give up if you're completely lost because it should be should be some interesting things coming up anyway. This dimension of, of the Hilbert space is there or not? So the ordinary dimension of all of these Hilbert spaces is, is infinite. 
they're all in, uh, you know, if you have a two one factor, then for it to act on a Hilbert space at all, that Hilbert yes. space has to be infinite dimensional. Of course, yes, yes. Okay. So they're all, um, they all have this real value dimension in this. Yeah. But it's the, be in the this whole dimension, thing. yeah. Yeah. This dimension there, it should have an M on it too, I suppose. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. I see this is the typo here. Right, correct. There should be a sub M. Thank you. Good. I mean, yeah, maybe. You notice that typo, then you're with it. Excellent. <laughs> one thing see, that, sorry? One thing that I always found help, uh, you know, that I found confusing for a while, but then found helpful. If you're used to thinking of like things as being semi-simple and breaking up into a direct sum of simples that's very this is sort of like what happens if you know that when you have sub things it breaks up as a direct sum but you don't know that but because you don't have like an introduction dimension you don't know that that process has to stop so these are some representation you split it up into two parts and you can just keep going forever because the dimensions can just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller Okay, thank you, Noah. All right, so let's end that discussion. I think that gives us some some idea. We're going to see some um, Hilbert spaces where this really genuinely works very shortly. All right, so but I'm still trying to understand to to communicate my dream here. So um, let's keep on going until I've got the dream communicated. So it was Atia who first noticed the relevance of phenomenal algebra in geometry with his index theorem for covering spaces. Here is a simple idea. Uh, so if you take a manifold, um, which is a Galois covering another one, so W is the quotient of V by some group, group of deck transformations. If you choose a nice smooth measure on V, um, which is invariant under gamma, then that's the same as a smooth measure on the quotient. And then we're just gonna say, all right, just look at this situation from the point of view of L2, from the point of view of gamma. What's, you know, so this is pretty crazy. You can split up W, uh, sorry, split up V in any way you like. We know that there's a fundamental domain, which is a particularly nice way to split it up, but from the L2 point of view, it could be some arbitrary measurable nonsense, but let's choose a fundamental domain. Then what does L2 of the big space look like if you're, if you're gamma. Well, gamma is taking this fundamental domain and translating it all over the place into disjoint things. So you get a direct sum of over the group gamma of L2 of W, of where W is identified with the fundamental domain. Measurably, who cares? The action of gamma, of course, is just, you can just un untwist it and it's the left regular representation tends to the identity on L2 of the fundamental domain, okay? And another way to write that Hilbert space is little L2 of gamma tensored the fundamental with L2 of the fundamental domain, which is nothing but a direct sum of copies of, uh, sorry, this is another typo, bad, bad, bad. A direct sum of copies of capital L2 of the fundamental domain. So, well, I suppose it's also a direct sum of copies of L2 of gamma if you take it as, okay, so it's not a typo, maybe that's what I meant to say. So anyway, any gamma invariant closed subspace of L2 of V has a dimension over the Fulman algebra. So you see, the, right, the left regular representation is acting on this Hilbert space, which is the same thing as this Hilbert space. So since it's acting and it acts like a, as a direct sum of copies of L2 of gamma, so I really didn't, this wasn't the typo, um, any gamma invariant closed subspace has a dimension of, over the Fulman algebra of gamma because the whole space is a direct sum of copies of little l2 of gamma. One may thus immediately define the index of an elliptic operator um, as a as the dif difference between the dimensions of the kernel and co-kernel measured by this phenomenon algebra. And Atia explicitly mentioned the case of Fuchsian groups uh, acting on H. But it's interesting to reread his paper because you know he had this and then he said, okay, my index theorem. His index theorem, by the way, I guess I don't say it, but his index theorem says that this um, index, if you have an invariant elliptic operator, so if you have an elliptic operator on the quotient, then you can lift it to an invariant one that has a Fulman index. And his result was that the index on the quotient is the same as the Fulman index. So he deduced from this, it's really interesting to go back. He says, okay, let's look at 
Well, he actually used um, Fuchsian group as a fundamental group of the surface. He said, all right, we take this thing, uh, we do the index calculation on the surface, and then that guarantees us um, L2 holomorphic functions upstairs. And he leaves it at that. He says, this is, this is a nice uh, um, existence theorem. And then he goes on to, of course, exploit his theorem in vast generalities. He says, uh, let's look at the most general situation, discrete series of some groups and so on and so forth. And in the spirit of the times, he immediately goes on to do very general things. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we say, okay, we've got this function, uh, these L2 holomorphic functions. Uh, we actually know what they are. They're this Bergman space business. And we're going to stick at that. And that's going to be the beginning rather than the end of the study of that from the point of view of phenomena. Atiyah, obviously, it's amazing that he knew what he did about phenomena, but it wasn't, you know, his... His, it wasn't his. Um, it wasn't in his guts, shall we say? So he he just used them sort of as a tool to get these his index theorem going. But we're going to say, all right, we're really interested in the two one factors, and we just take that um, a tier construction as the start of the things, and we we'll look at it in a bit more depth, a lot more depth. So our context is going to be this. Gamma is going to be a Fuchsian group. So remember, that's just a discrete subgroup, possibly of all you know, finite covolume ones. And here we have a typo. Finite covolume ones are all ICC. Um, this is a result of Ackerman and possibly others. So we're definitely in um, in um, two one factor world. And then it's going to act on the Bergman space of L2 holomorphic functions, HS, with respect to this measure, y to the s dx dy over y squared on the upper half plane. Uh, maybe this is the point to say that, um, well, maybe I'll say it later on, but the usual Bergman space people work on the disk, and there's, um, there's a slight difference in parameter, but I'll get to that. So this measure is not invariant, that's the point. The measure is not invariant. The, the measure that is invariant is uh, for s equals zero. dx dy over y squared is a hyperbolic measure, might measure coming from hyperbolic space, and that is invariant. So that's why we use y to the s. Um, um, but anyway, in terms of the action on Hilbert space, you have to do general correct with the radon nicotine derivative, but here you can do it in a holomorphic way. Uh, if s is real, one over c z plus d uh, to the s, uh, you have to just have to choose a logarithm, then that makes sense. And um, that uh, makes sense in the formula for g of, g of xi. So the upshot of this is simply that the, the representation of gamma, which is a Fuchsian group, think PSL2z if you want, on L2 of h y to the p dx dy over y squared um, is unitary, and it's just an infinite number of copies of the regular representation, just as it was in the, the Atiyah thing. It's just a slight modification of the Atiyah thing. And any geometric subspaces will have a von Neumann dimension. In particular, we can speak of the dimension, the von Neumann dimension, measured by the von Neumann algebra of gamma of Bergman space. Okay. So we can, so that's, that's the playground. That's our playground. We're going to think of the Bergman space HS as a module for the von Neumann algebra, and it has this von Neumann dimension. And here is the formula that I insist is correct, okay? All other formulas may be wrong. This one is correct. The von Neumann dimension of HS, uh, S, remember, is this parameter, is S minus 1 over 4 pi times the hyperbolic area of the quotient, or co-volume, if you like, of the, of the quotient, okay? Now, full disclosure here, some of you may have been worried about this because of this, um, this logarithm that's required, the branch, and so on. You need to, you do need to be uh, a little bit careful when s is not an even integer, um, and you might, you know, there's some projective stuff, some multiple multiplicative factor, but this that doesn't stop this relevant algebra being a, a two one factor and having von Neumann dimension and having um, and this formula from being correct. So let's just forget about that and assume that it all goes through for all real numbers in the same way. 
Okay, now what about our fabulous special case, uh, PSL2Z? Well, the von Neumann dimension when PSL2Z of HS, so we put S equal to S in this measure, von Neumann dimension, dimension is S minus one over 12. Now, I don't know who was the first to actually do this calculation. I did it in the book with Fred and Pierre uh, almost 40 years ago, and um, a lot of people have checked it. Florine Rodolescu has checked it, and I've checked it a dozen times recently, so it's, it's right. Uh, in particular, the number one is important, right? We, so why is number one important? Number one means that you have phenomenon dimension being one, which means that your Hilbert space is actually the L2 space of the 2-1 factor. This canonical, very special situation in the phenomenon dimension is one. So for SL2Z, we get one of S is 13. Great. What's, you know, that's... Um, a bit funny why 13, but that, that's the way it is. The so phenomenon algebra, the dimension, you get this canonical, very special module when S is 13. And here's the formula. If gamma is the uh, fu fundamental group of a closed Riemann surface, you get this. And presumably you could deduce this from Atiyah's uh, index theorem. He doesn't do it but in this paper, but um, he, I'm sure he could have. So you'll notice that if you want to get one for a Riemann surface, uh, comp this is a compact Riemann surface, uh, you need S equals two and G equals two. Doesn't make sense for G equals one, of course. And that's it. So in Riemann surfaces, you very, very seldom get um, for Neumann dimension one. All right, uh, what's the significance of Riemann of dimension being one? Well, um, well that's what I want to go into. From the properties of the dimension function, we know that H is uh, the left module, it's just the standard left module. And if you take them out, gamma to gamma inverse, uh, it extends to an involution on L2 of M with the property that if you conjugate the phenomenon algebra by this involution, you get the right regular representation, right? Gamma going to gamma inverse is some kind of anti thingy, so it exchanges left and right. And uh, so when you do this, you get the, the right regular representation, which is also called the commutant. And this is our notation for commutant due to Marian von Neumann. So J M J equals M prime. This happens exactly when um, the von Neumann dimension is one. Uh, and rephrasing this, we can get away from the group. If you define the map J to be, uh, if Xi is the identity of M, and, J, and you define j of x psi equals x star psi, then that's the same map. And, um, and that gives you a identification of m and its commutant. Okay, and now we get to the, the good stuff. But in fact, uh, if, you know, if you only know that this thing is abstractly isomorphic to L2 of m, then, then to say the vector one doesn't make sense. All, so we, we got from our thing, we got that the von Neumann dimension is equal to one. That means it's isomorphic to L2 of M, but not in any canonical way. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to use the identity of M, but in fact, you could use any other vector provided it's a trace vector. So we could put eta in place of psi in this formula, uh, provided eta has this property, trace vector, trace of X. Remember there was a trace of X on this, to one factor, the trace of x is just given by the coefficient of this vector, then it will, you, can, you can use it and you get this an, a, a corresponding j and, um, and it will still be true that this j identifies m and m prime via an anti-isomorphism. Okay, so uh, I think I've already said it, if you, if you just know that you have a module of dimension one, then there's no canonical identification of M with L2 of M, nor hence of M with M prime. But the slogan is identifications of M with M prime, or, or if you like the Hilbert space with L2 of M, are the same thing as trace vectors. So this is the really important the trace vector is a vector in the Hilbert space whose coefficient is the trace. And um, I not, don't think I'm going to get to this, but trace vector for M is the same thing as trace vector for M prime if the dimension is one. All right. 
let me pause for questions because this is um, trace facts are going to be everywhere dense from now on and very significant. Trace factor is just something in an abstract M module of dimension one or any dimension uh, that the coefficient of that vector, this is the coefficient, actually gives you the trace. Any questions? Well, Noah maybe has a comment to help. Not this time. Okay, so that's what a trace vector is. Oh, you know, if, you, if it feels a bit mysterious to you, then just think in the n by n matrices where you have, you know, the, in the n by n matrices, if you just have it acting on c to the n, then you, you can't get a trace vector. You need a bunch of them. Um, but if you have it acting on the direct sum of c to the n n times, then there's a trace vector. You can combine those to get a trace vector. All right. So returning to the concrete context, we see that for PSL to Z, there is a trace vector for its action on the space H13 of L2 holomorphic functions. Okay, this is crazy. H13, and just the, in this number 13, there is a trace vector. And here's the challenge, find one. Okay, I've thought about this on and off for almost 40 years without success. And I know that Florine Radulescu, who's listening, has also thought about it a lot, and he hasn't come up with one either. All right, now, now I come to the dream. Why would such a vector be so significant? Well, here we go. We have seen that it would allow us to identify for Neumann algebra of gamma with its commutant. That's what trace vectors are all about. Which brings us to the beautiful result of Radulescu. We know that every pair F and G of cusp forms with the same weight gives us an element. Remember going back, back a bit, I hope you remember this. The cusp forms, we're thinking of as multiplication operators between these Bergman spaces. So if we have two of the same weight, then you take the star of one times the other, then that actually, because they intertwine, that actually intertwines the action of, of von Neumann algebra. That is to say, this bounded operator is in the commutant of von Neumann algebra of gamma on HS, for every S. For every S, you take a cusp form, you go up and then back with multiplication between two cusp forms, you get a, um, an element of the commutant. And Rolescu's theorem is that for any S bigger than one, the vector space, not only do these things generate the, the vector, the uh, commutant, but they're dense in uh, the relevant topologies in the commutant of the von Neumann algebra. Okay, so this is great. This means that if we had an explicit trace vector for S equals 13, we would have an explicit identification of the von Neumann algebra of gamma and the von Neumann algebra of gamma prime. Now, the von Neumann algebra of gamma is the free group on, uh, is the PSL2Z, and the, von, and the commutant by Rolescu is cusp forms. So we would have an explicit way to identify cusp form things with PSL2Z. And in passing, by the way, I just said that this, if you take the trace, you get this Peterson inner product. I'm not going to use that very much, but it was one of the motivating things in the beginning. So here's the dream. We see that just the calculation of von Neumann dimensions gives us an abstract identification of cusp forms and the group von Neumann algebra of PSL2Z. But by results of Voiculescu and Radulescu dicoma, we know that there's a random matrix model for von Neumann algebra of PSL2Z. So this establishes a direct connection between cusp forms and random matrices. This is a theorem. Now there's a lot of uh, observations, statistical observations that also show a connection between cusp forms and uh, L functions and so on and random matrices. The person that I've learned this from is Keating um, and a lot of other people, but much remains unproven. Unfortunately, so the, the, the dream is that we can actually going to be able to prove a whole lot of these things um, because we have a direct connection. It's a theorem. But unfortunately, the, our direct connection is an abstract nonsense connection and it's rather useless unless we can get an explicit map and an explicit map is a trace vector. Okay, so that's why I think it's so important to get a, uh, an explicit and you know, it has to be a bit more explicit, it has to be manageable, trace vector for this action of a 2-1 factor on, this, uh, on a definite Hilbert space. 
Okay, that's the, so that's the dream that one could actually use this established direct connection to actually prove things about uh, the relationship between cusp forms and random matrices. So now um, that's the dream. Now you know, bring coming down to earth a bit. Although having a trace vector would just be the start, the difficulty in finding one. So right, we've got to get one, and it's got to be a nice one in some sense. Um, but the difficulty in finding one suggests that if you could actually get one, then it may, would maybe reveal some deep facts. So we're tempted to call an explicit trace vector a holy grail vector. All right. Feel free to take all this with a grain of salt. It's all, you know, super speculation and, and wishful thinking, and maybe April the 1st would have been the right day. Um, but the search for, but so now we come to the spin-off of the spin-off. The search for trace vectors has not been entirely fruitless and has given an interesting spin-off in terms of uh, results of zeros of Bergman space functions. The connection between zeros and trace vectors came with a new and perhaps surprising idea, which I want to tell you about now. Uh, time is, oh shit. Um, the use of a left ordering on a Fuchsian group, which I think people in this, in this world have not ever used before. It's going to be the key. So uh, just as a teaser, I would like to give an example of how for Neumann dimension can be easy to manipulate and give results that really seem to be quite difficult. So in, at this point, I would like to acknowledge frequent and fruitful conversations with Kurt McMullen on just about everything that I'm going to talk about from now on. Oh, yes. Yeah, so now th this connection with Bergman space in the usual notation. If we use the disk model, the usual notation for this weighted Bergman space is A2 sub alpha, where alpha is bigger than minus one, which is the space of holomorphic functions on the unit disk, which is square integrable for the measure, this measure, one minus absolute value squared to the alpha dx dy. This is up to switching from the disk to the upper half plane, what we've called HS with S equals alpha plus two. The reason for the discrepancy is, so, is sort of natural between S and alpha. Um, Alpha equals zero here is just Lebesgue measure. And if you were doing you know, Bergman space in that spirit, then that Lebesgue measure would be an interesting one. S equals zero we saw as hyperbolic measure. And so if you're doing stuff in the spirit of Fuchsian groups, then that's the measure that you would consider as the natural one. Um, okay. So here's, here's a, I'm gonna prove a theorem with, with almost nothing from, um, from Lumen dimension. Here we go. Let F be a cusp form of weight P. Then for any S, any re real S, we can take multiplication from this Bergman space, weight S, to the Bergman space of weight S plus P. P is the weight of the cusp form. That intertwines the action of gamma. So it defines a gamma linear injection. So this maps HS as a gamma module to H of S plus P. The closure of its image is a Hilbert space of dimension for Neumann gamma, for Neumann equal to that of H S. Um, F, this is injective. It's injective because, you know, multiplication by a holomorphic function is always going to be injective. You can't get anything kernel. So the closure of its image is a Hilbert space of dimension equal to that of H S. So M of S has taken HS and given us a submodule by taking its closure of HS plus P. But look, so it's of dimension one, sorry, it's of dimension the same as HS, so it's sitting in here, but this has a bigger for Neumann dimension. So therefore, there has to be something in HS plus P which is orthogonal to the image of MF. Okay, for Neumann dimension of HS is strictly bigger, so there are in fact many vectors in HS plus B orthogonal to the image of MF, or, and here's that written out in full, there exists a, a, a vector, non-zero obviously, which this is the inner product in Bergman space, F of Z, Xi Z, A to Z bar, Y of S plus B, DX DY is equal to zero. For all Xi. So there we go, we've got an existence theorem. So this is a, sort of akin to Atiyah saying that we get these uh, L2 holomorphic functions. We get L2 holomorphic functions that are orthogonal to the image, the cusp form. Okay, so there it is again. 
there exists an eta which is orthogonal to every multiplication by the cusp form in any vector in HS. So this is an abstract existence theorem. Like with trace vectors, it's another job to actually find such an eta. Now, if f happens to have zeros, this is easy. Bergman space is a reproducing Colonel Hilbert space, which means that for every z, there's a vector epsilon z, which gives you the value of the function of z with the inner product. So if f of z is equal to zero, if the cusp form happens to have a zero z, then m of f psi of z is equal to zero, because we just do multiplication. And this means by taking the inner product that epsilon of z is orthogonal to the image of m of f. Bingo, so we've done it. So in the case where f has a zero, uh, we can actually explicitly find uh, vectors very easily in the orthogonal complement of the image. Now then, the modular discriminant uh, doesn't have any zeros. And I think at this stage, I don't know if Kurt happens to be listening, he might be able to tell us, but I, I believe that we, at this stage, we do not know how to produce an explicit L2 holomorphic function orthogonal to the image of M delta. That's the way it is. So this theorem, this abstract existence theorem, gives a, a non-trivial uh, result about modular form, about um, Bergman space functions orthogonal to the image of N delta. Um, Parkin might know how to, we have, fortunately we have an expert in um, Bergman space listening in, Harkin Hedenbaum, who um, might have the answer to that, I don't know. Somehow it's uh, zeros at the, uh, at the boundary. Exactly, a zero at the boundary, right. Yeah. yeah, so but the question, so, yeah. So um, this also suggests the importance of zeros and modular functions in the analysis of Bergman spaces. And this is the line we'll follow. But just before that, let me say, this seems crazy. All we've used is a simple dimension uh, of the, the phenomenon dimension. Is it reasonable to expect that simple arguments on phenomenon dimension can lead to highly non-trivial results? Well, there is a case where this actually happens, which is the case, uh, this famous case of Kaplansky theorem, where uh, if you take the if you take a group algebra um, over a field of zero characteristic, then it has a property that a b equals one implies b a equals one, and that is very very easy using uh, phenomenon algebras, but is apparently quite difficult in the other way. In fact, uh, the problem is open and characteristic non-zero. All right, so now I'm gonna go and just jump in and, and state a, a theorem that we can prove, um, which has no mention of phenomenal algebras or cusp forms whatsoever. So here it is. So let gamma be a Fuchsian group, and I'm gonna have this special condition that gamma of Z, the orbit that Z is a point, um, which has no fixed points for any element of gamma. So you take gamma, no fixed points in the orbit for any other element. So it's a special condition, but we'll see how relevant it is afterwards. And here we have, S is less than or equal to one plus four pi over the co-volume of gamma. There is no non-zero function in HS vanishing on gamma of Z. And if S is bigger than one plus four pi over the co-volume of gamma, there is a non-zero function. So let's just um, understand what this means. If you just rewrite this in a different way, we find that this particular value of S, when, when you have equality here, is precisely the value for which uh, the phenomenon dimension is one. Okay, so that's the relevance of this particular number. Okay, so there's the theorem. That there's a dichotomy. Um, what I just discovered recently was that this actually works for equality here as well. I can prove that. Um, so let me just give a quickly give a little context. Hardy space, uh, H2, these are the, is the smaller space in all the Bergman spaces. These are functions, L, uh, holomorphic, but um, they are certainly in the, in the Bergman spaces, but they have this extra property that you can integrate around circles and you get something square integral around circle, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's, uh, it's known that the, using the Blaschke product, that if you just take any sequence Zn in the disk, then you look for a Hardy space function vanishing on that sequence. Well, it's true that if and only if the sum over n of all of the distances from these points to the boundary is uh, 
less than infinity. Um, thus, it's a corollary of our theorem, uh, since we show that there are no, not even any Bergman space functions, that orbit, sum over an orbit of gamma of 1 minus z diverges, which of course is a well-known function. Uh, attempts to extend the Hardy space results to Bergman space have only been partially successful. And there's a book by, um, by Haken and Kornblum and, and Zhu, which gives a necessary and sufficient condition in terms of a complicated entropy related density. So if you're given some sequence, they define this density and they say, uh, there is a condition. Um, so it's a, there's a number, if it's less than that, there are zeros. This is a zero set. If it's bigger than that, it isn't it? Sorry, it's the other way around, isn't it? If it's less than that, it isn't a zero set. If it's bigger than that, it is. And um, there's a critical value for which uh, the answer from I can tell is unknown. So we actually, we can interpret our theorem as actually calculating this density for Fuchsian groups. And, in, and also we can solve the problem of, uh, when, of equality, when this critical value S equals is actually, uh, we can say that there's none for that. There's not a zero set for that. Okay, I want to talk, unfortunately, of course, time, I've only got 15 minutes. So um, I'm going to have to speed up a little, which is too bad because this is where the fun starts. Uh, I'll go, the, the one, one, of, one of them is very easy. So let me do this super quickly. It's just the same kind of argument as we used um, to sh in, in that teaser before to show existence of functions orthogonal. If S is bigger than one plus the four pi over the co-volume, for instance, if, um, if the co-volume is, um, is infinite, we get that there is a non-zero function in HS. And this is easy to just, instead of taking um, multiplication operator, you take the phenomenon algebra and apply it to this evaluation vector, epsilon z, this reproducing kernel vector. This has phenomenon dimension at most one, because it's, there's a cycle, you know, it's, it can't have any more. You just apply the phenomenon algebra. So there's a non-zero vector orthogonal to it. And by this re reproducing kernel property, the vector vanishes on the orbit. Of course, getting explicit functions is another story. Multiplication by cusp forms works for PSL2z, largest, largest values of S. Uh, but, Larry, but I'm very grateful to Larry Rowland and Ian Wagner for showing that you can improve this construction by dominating the pole of the, um, the modular function J of Q at zero with the Dedekind eta function to produce examples for all S strictly bigger than the critical value 13. So for PSL2z at least, we can get explicit ones for in this area and the abstract nonsense very easily gives the existence of um, non-explicit ones and for any Fuchsian group. All right, now the fun starts when we take when we, the other um, condition. So I'm gonna split up into two. When this is strictly less than one, when, when the phenomenon dimension is strictly less than one and when the phenomenon dimension is actually equal to one. So, and this has been the new, the new technique. So we want to show that there's no non-zero function vanishing on the orbit. And we're going to use the hypothesis. Now we're going to use the hypothesis on the orbit. We didn't use it before. So um, let's describe a stronger hypothesis than this just for the purposes of um, getting this proof out. We're going to say a group is left orderable if there's a total order on the group, so which means that any two elements are comparable which is invariant under left translation. So if alpha is less than beta, then gamma, if is this true if and only if gamma of alpha is less than gamma of beta. Now I only know about this because it was a big flurry about 20 years ago um, about left orderable groups when Patrick de Hornoir first proved that the braid groups are left orderable using some uh, logic kind of argument <coughs> and that got <coughs> very popularized, but anyway, uh, free groups are left orderable. Fundamental groups of surfaces are left orderable. Um, left orderable groups are trivially torsion free. So the actions as Fuchsian groups on the upper half plane are free. So that's what I'm making this hypothesis to get, gets rid of all of these fixed points. Now I'm going to use another suggestive terminology for uh, the trace vector. Um, and this is in general, if you have a group acting on it or even a semi-group acting on a Hilbert space, we call a vector 
xi a wandering vector if uh, it has this property that g xi xi is that g xi is orthogonal to xi whenever g is non-trivial. So obviously a wandering vector is a trace vector for, for the form norm analysis, the unit vector, because that's exactly what trace vectors are. Right? So I really didn't need to say wandering vector, but it gives a nice intuition. And in some parts of mathematics, they call wandering vectors. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a wandering vector from an element of HS which vanishes on an orbit of gamma. Now, for convenience, I'm going to suppose it's the orbit of zero, and we're going to work in the disc, disc picture, this neither here nor there. But here's the, here's the new trick. So we choose this left ordering on gamma, and we let um, eta belonging to the uh, Bergman space have a zero of order one at each point of the orbit. Order one is just for convenience also. So we made it zero, we made the, the group orderable, all these things just for convenience. So now we're going to define these two closed subspaces of HS, Hilbert space. So these are vector spaces, Hilbert spaces of um, holomorphic functions in Bergman space. So the first one, V, is going to be the, um, uh, the space, this is going to be the, the bigger one, this is going to be the space of all functions that vanish on half of the orbit, the, the functions that vanish when gamma is less than or equal to the identity, and then a slightly smaller space, which is the functions that vanish when gamma is strictly less than the identity. These are the, this is the new trick here. So it's clear that um, eta, we said that eta has a, order, a zero of order one at each point of the orbit, so certainly on half of the orbit, so eta is in V, so that, which is the smallest one. No, oh, sorry, W is the smallest. Eta is in W, which is the smallest one. It's sometimes a bit confusing which is the biggest and the smallest. Eta is in W, so that W and V are non-zero. No, oh. sorry. Yeah. Eta is in V, V is the smallest one. This is the way you get confused. Okay. Now, the, all of this junk here is just uh, is nothing. This is just saying that what you can do is you can apply the, the shift operator, which invariant subspaces people look at a bit. You multiply by z inverse to a to z. And that a to z initially had a 0 at 0. Uh, here it is. a to has a 0 of order 1 at 0. Multiplying it by z inverse uh, pops that 0. And um, we get a function which is um in the bigger one but not in the smaller one so let's see v is things that vanish for everything less than or equal to zero and uh, w is the things that vanish for everything strictly less than zero so by we've taken this element of v and we've popped that zero at zero and and made it not a zero but it's, we haven't changed the zero everywhere else so it's still in in, uh, in W. So this is just the analysis that shows that this is still an L2, L2 function. So Z inverse, it, it vanishes on gamma minus zero, but it's non-zero at zero. This means that V is strictly contained in W, is what they are. And um, so, okay, so this, hopefully this picture, this is very confusing and just saying in words like that, but this picture hopefully will um, make things a lot clearer. It's extremely schematic, this picture. Uh, the thing, it doesn't look like this at all, but it allows you to understand what I'm saying. So here's the, uh, here, the, the x's are the orbit. This is the positive part. This is the negative part. W is the things that vanish on this part of the orbit. And V, the bigger one, they also vanish at zero. So, um, so that's a picture which is hopefully makes you understand it. What we, we will show that a vector in the orthogonal complement of V is a, is a wandering vector for gamma. Okay, now this is this crazy argument. It doesn't look like it has any chance of working, but I've been over it so many times now that I, it's just simply true. Um, there's no way I can, you can just look at it and meditate on it and do it yourself. It's, uh, you know, it's just a completely trivial little argument. 
the only trick is that, that you, you start by, you translate it by the positive elements and that sort of shifts everything to the right a bit um, and it forces the translative gamma of the original vector to actually be in the smaller subspace, so it's orthogonal. Um, and then uh, some <laughs> really dumb trickery says, well, if it's orthogonal for all positive elements, then you take the you take the adjoint and it's orthogonal for all negative elements as well. So crazy argument, but it works. All right. And now we can really do stuff with it. So any non-zero wandering vector is a trace vector for the Fermi algebra it generates. But our Fermi algebra dimension calculates gave us the um, the the dimension is s minus one over four pi times the co-volume, which is less than one under the hypothesis of the theorem. Remember the the theorem said the Fermi dimension has to be less than one. So thus a trace vector cannot exist for s less than one plus four pi of the co-volume. Okay, it's ridiculous. We've, we've, we've taken this function with all its zeros, we've produced a trace vector, but the von Neumann dimension is less than one, so there can't be a trace vector. Because if there was, then you would have a copy of the space of dimension one, and no such eta can exist. So that's the, that proves the theorem. Amazingly enough, there is, so let's go back to the theorem, what we've just proved. What we proved is, is part one, for the strict inequality. If S is strictly less than this, there is no function in Bergman space vanishing on the orbit. If there was, you would have a trace vector and you can't have a trace vector because the von Neumann dimension is too small. There we go, that's it. All right, now this, this, uh, the, to treat the case S equals one, this is a new, new trick that I came up with. Uh, it's something, <laughs> It's, it's, it's a little bit more that you get from this construction. Um, this theorem, this construction actually use, only used half the orbit, whereas we know that the, the vector eta the, the vanishes on the whole orbit. That was the hypothesis. Well, you see, if it vanishes on the whole orbit, then it remains orthogonal to the trace vector we constructed. Because if it vanishes on the whole orbit, it vanishes on half the orbit, and the trace vector we've constructed was by construction orthogonal to half the orbit, so it's still orthogonal. So in the case where S is equal to one, we get a trace vector and we get another vector that's orthogonal to it, and M orthogonal to it, so it can't happen. So um, there we go. So that takes care of the case uh, where, the, where S is equal to one plus the co-volume, i.e. where the von Neumann dimension is one. All right, now uh, I want to get away from this case. Uh, I said, the, I didn't say that the group was ordered. So that uh, wasn't the original hypothesis. I did it for some, to, to um, make the argument clearer. Well, in general, this group, ordered group method works across orbits and fixed points for the, out, for the action of gamma count according to the order of the stabilizer as in those Riemann rock theorems and the formula that you will see in SARE. Uh, but I, do, I have to confess that I don't fully understand what's going on at, at infinity. So this is related to the this question of getting things that orthogonal, um, you know, what, at the cusp. I don't really understand the cusp, the contribution of the cusp. So first of all, uh, let me, well, I'm nearing the end now, which is good because time is running just about out. Um, first of all, a rather bizarre way of showing that there is no cusp form of weight less than 12, okay? So this is well known, you know, we know all cusp forms, but I'm going to do it in a different way. Um, so once again, I'm going to show using this method that there is no cusp form of weight less than 12 for PSL2z. So this delta is the smallest cusp form. Let's suppose it was such a form, and I'm going to apply this method of uh, Roland and Wagner. I'm going to, so now I'm going to tell you what that method is. We're going to choose a W belonging to uh, the upper half plane for which J of W is not a fixed point for anything. J is, and you know, that's, uh, if you know about J, that's not a <laughs> difficulty, it's almost always true. So this function J of W minus J of Z minus J of W is PSL to an invariant and vanishes on the orbit of W, obviously. And it has a Q expansion with a simple pole at Q equals zero. J has a pole at Q equals zero. 
we can, can cure this divergence by first multiplying by f, f was our putative cusp form, that kills the pole, we still don't get a bounded operator, but we can take, this is a, this is cunning uh, Roland Wagner, we can take a small positive real value of delta of z. Delta doesn't vanish, so you can take a logarithm. The absolute value of the resulting function satisfies the bound to make it the bounded map from hs to hs plus the weight of s plus the epsilon. The epsilon we were forced to take because of this positive real power of delta. The image of this map consists of functions vanishing on the orbit of w. But if you choose s slightly bigger than one and epsilon very small, and then the, if, if the weight of the cusp form is less than 12, we end up with this number, hs being less than 13, strictly less than 13. <clears throat> the theorem said, nope, no functions vanishing on orbits for t less than 13. So we've actually proved that there's no cusp form of weight less than 12 for PSL dz. Once you have a cu no cusp forms, given the Eisenstein series of weights 2k, it's not hard to get the whole algebra of modular forms. Um, <clears throat> the only uh, uh, slightly tricky thing you need is when k is equal to 1, where you have this E2, which is not a, a modular form. But that's OK, too. You can do that. Because if you um, had these two cases, this thing of weight, weight, um, weight 2, if it had zeros, then you're out of luck because of what we've done. If it had no zeros, you could divide delta by, by the thing of no zeros and get a disallowed cusp form. So in this way, you can calculate the whole um, algebra of uh, modular forms for SL2z, and I'm sure it will work for in much greater generality than that. So it's a little bit tongue in cheek because, of course, this calculation is extremely well known to uh, anyone in analytic number theory. But I find it rather intriguing that one can do it without any, any with, with using this analysis trick and ordered groups rather than um, contour integration. So I have barely any time for uh, the last corollary. Um, in the book of um, Hedenbaum, Kornblum, and Zhu, one reads that the uh, this is their necessary and con sufficient condition um, for the existence of zero sets. And they're doing it in LP context. In our context, P is zero. Uh, sorry, P is two. It's L2. So we can just immediately translate this result. And we get that their, their density, D plus of A, has to be equal to 2 pi over the covolume co of gamma. So miraculously, without doing any estimates, any entropy things, we've calculated their, uh, their function. Uh, here is an example to show that the freeness of the action on the orbit is essential. Okay, then we just, okay, I'll just skip that because we're just about done. And end up with this last thing. To conclude, one might have hoped to obtain the holy grail vector by the left orderable group method, but it has been thwarted since the value we're interested in is the critical value. And we've shown that there is no element of Bergman space vanishing on the orbit. So we know, so we're in a tantalizing situation where we know by abstract for Neumann non nonsense that there is a trace vector for the critical value of S, but we're completely as unable as we were before to lay our hands on one. <clears throat>